Hello, everyone. Welcome to a very special episode of Amigos. Uh, this past weekend, Aaron unfortunately injured his eye when he was up at the camp and is out of commission for the time being. So please send your thoughts, your prayers, your well wishes his way uh, for a speedy recovery. In the meantime, for Amigos this week, we are going to be listening to an interview that I did with gaming legend Tony Warner, the man behind Beneath the Steel Sky, Lure of the Temptress, Broken Sword, among others. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Tony Warner. I want to talk a little bit about that because I've always wondered... You know, I watched Micro Men, which is how I get all of my information, okay, yeah. a completely factual account of, the, of, the, of how all that worked out. And um, once the computers were in the school, I mean, what it wasn't as if the, the, all of the teachers suddenly had knowledge of what to do with these things. They didn't have any knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> so once they were there, what role did they play in the life of the students? Uh, well, the, the, this, I mean, the computers coincided with the beginning of a, of a new, a new subject, which was, um, computer studies, mm. which was a, which was a, a thing you could take. And, uh, I mean, that's why they were there. And, um, you know, the, the teachers were terrified because, you know, what, what, what do we do with these machines? So they had no idea. Um, I mean, we had no idea either. Uh, my friends and I, we, we were we were looking at sort of electronics, you know, like um, building little radios and stuff. With that. And it, it was kind of fun, but it was difficult as well. You know, it's, it, some people got a knack for electronics, but it's kind of kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, at the same time, there was like the Sinclair adverts for the for the ZX eighty one. They had a big blitz where they were appearing in the national papers, and we were like, D don't really know what it is, but it looks quite interesting. And a friend of mine got a ZX eighty one. And I sort of went around to have a look, and it was this amazing thing that you could you could just do different things, and like if it went wrong, you know, electronics, you blew it up, and you were, that was it, it's game over, and you were going back to Tandy again at the weekend, you know, to replace the bits you just shorted out. Um, computers, you, you just you just do something, try it, try it, try it, and eventually it works, and and games, you know, mm -hmm. and you could make games. Yeah, it was just like a world. It was like it just it, the world just expanded. It was this world of creativity opened up. So were you always somebody that would rather do more of the coding side than just sit down and, and play in the games? Yeah, you'd play a game and you'd go, I wonder how they did that. Mm -hmm. Then you'd start, you'd go, can we do that? And you wouldn't think it was possible. You know, you, does anyone remember a 3D monster craze on the ZX81? When we first, when we first saw that monster coming up there, it's like, how the hell have they done that? But you knew, once you'd seen it, you knew that you knew it could be done. So you'd like work it out. Mm -hmm. Like you go, go play with the machine. Can you work out how to do it? And a lot of times, you know, I've talked to a lot of coders and they, they talk about how they, they just sort of experimented with things until they got it right. But nobody ever says, you know, I typed in this program in the back of a magazine and that gave me some insight on how the program worked. So it was a really two different tracks. If you were serious about game development, you never really looked at the sort of code, the, the basic code that you type in. Yeah, I did a couple. I mean, there was a, there was a magazine called Input. I don't know if anybody remembers Input. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and... Uh... You know, it, you, you're taking your life into your hands with those things because the chances of getting from the start to the end of the listing <laughs> with the same, the same thing, uh, and it was just most of it was just hex pages mm -hmm. of hex. I mean, you could do it, and, and and then you'd get a game, and you could and then you could look at it and see maybe you could understand how they did it. I mean, it was a start, but pretty quickly we moved on from that. You know, you you, you, you do it a few times, you 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 rewrite it a bit, you play with it, and then it's like no no start again, mm -hmm. do our own thing. You know. Yeah. So what was what was, do you remember the first, uh, maybe not a full game, but the, one of the first things that you were able to kind of accomplish uh, by with coding? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, it was all little things, little things, and then eventually we tried to, we tried to make a. a, a eventually, I, I got a machine called Computers Link, the first one I bought because I, I thought it was better than the Spectrum for learning to program on. I had like a machine code monitor, and you could type hex into it and stuff. Uh, so I learned on that. And we wrote, in summer holidays, we wrote this game, and it was like a platform game. And I thought, this is going to be a big hit, you know, I'm going to send this off. And, and I think I did send it off the cassette, but it wasn't quite good enough. Well, it it's quite. possible that the bottom fell out of the computer's links market. Oh, yeah. 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 That was the other problem. Yeah. yeah. It was, it, it was short-lived. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah. yeah. So at what point did you move on to sort of a more mainstream machine code on? Uh 
yeah, from that I moved on to Amstrad CPC. Okay. Yeah, and that it, was that 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 lasted a while. Right. That was a good move. Yeah. What attracted you to the CPC versus the the ZX Spectrum? Was it the the actual real keyboard? Well, we saw it as the next thing on. Was it the length? Because that's what attracted me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the sheer size of the yeah. thing. There's the coloured keys. I yeah, just, I love those. The greens and the reds. Yeah, they were just really good shades. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, we saw it as as my friends and I. We saw it as like the next thing on. You know, the Spectrum was maybe there's this idea that the spectrum was going to fade maybe the amstrad was going to be the next big thing sure. so yeah and, and, and you know the monitor i mean everyone's everyone was knackering their eyes up looking at uh, crt screens the mm -hmm. tv screens that weren't really you know a few of my friends ended up with glasses because they were on a cheap tv screen and mm -hmm. all the colors were running and everything like that and and the, the cpc had a really good monitor so it was like this you know you can put the whole thing in a corner and uh, no one's going to bother you. No one's going to kick you off and say we want to watch um, the news or something, you know, yeah. or uh, Coronation Street as it was. You know, you could, no one's going to bother you. So Amstrad CPC, yeah, looked like it. And like you a good you deal. had to use the monitor that came with it, right? You had to, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's good. I mean, you, you could get a green one and a, and a color one. Mm -hmm. you, you get the color one, and you're away. You know, why it's do great. you think? Why do you think the CPC had so many just sort of lazy spectrum ports when it was capable of so much more? Uh, I guess that's what the publishers wanted. They'd go, we've got, we've got a specy version of this game, so let's just do it. I mean, eventually people started writing CPC first, you know. I mean, I wrote, I wrote my game Obsidian, I mean, it was, and I wrote it on, I wrote it on CPC, and that's what I developed it on. So, so it wasn't a bad, it, it wasn't a bad game for the machine, you know, and it was like, to begin with, you use the, you use the spec of the machine, you know, you use the colors that you know you've got. So it's not like you're going from a port. So, you, you know, they always wanted ports to be very cheap, you know, do it as quickly as you can. Um, but if, you, if you're writing the original on the, tar on the target machine, then it's going to be a bit better, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there weren't, eventually there were, yeah, they, eventually there were a lot, of, a lot of good games for the CPC. Mm -hmm. And there were the cheap ports. Yeah. Know. Sort of a mixed bag. Yeah, yeah. Did you, was that your first commercially released game? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, good. And uh, what, what was that like, the process of, I mean, did you just submit the tape and the, the publisher said, all right, that's good, let's do it. Yeah, I just 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 made some cassettes and send it off to a few places. And, mm -hmm. and there was a local company called uh, Arctic Computing. Some of you will remember them. Um, I'd forgotten about them. And my mother looked them up in the phone book and said, send, send tape there. And I was like, yeah, okay. And uh, I got a letter back from someone called Charles Cecil. Who, oh, who, I've who, heard of him. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and said, come and, come and talk to us about this game. So that's, that's how that came about. Mm -hmm. What was the feeling like when you walked into a shop and you saw your game sitting there on the shelf? Yeah, it's, it was good. Yeah, we we always like that. I mean, you, and you'd put it on top. You put it <laughs> number one off, but it, put it straight in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a good. It was good. I mean, you always imagine what it's going to be like, but it, it was it was always a good feeling. Yeah. Do you remember what you spent that first check on your first royalties check or whatever? Uh, I thought I was going to spend it on a Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> that that was and is the goal still, you know, of all of this um, Porsche nine eleven. Nothing's changed in that regard. Uh, it was sixty quid. Mm -hmm. You didn't get a Porsche. I didn't get a Porsche. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so, at that point, you were sort of established as a programmer. You'd had a game commercially released. Did you find that that gave you more leverage moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I went to obviously I went then to work at Arctic, and we did we did uh, we got embroiled in the in the horrendous mess that was um, World Cup Carnival '86. Oh, talk to me about that because I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, it was, I mean, it's a long story, but we got uh, time. U <laughs> <laughs> U.S. Gold had the rights to Mexico '86, the, the world the World Cup football, and they were writing to cut it to cut it really short. They were they were writing their own version of it. For, to come out in in time for the World Cup thing, uh, and they screwed it up. They had no game. They, you know, it had all gone wrong as, as game development is is wont to do. So they thought, what on earth are we going to do? You know, we're running out of time. It's like six, it's like it's the World Cup in six weeks. We've got no game. We've paid a we've paid a huge amount of money for this license. So they so they they, they put their heads together and thought, uh, Arctic have got have got a really bad football game called World Cup World Cup World Cup football something like that, and they said. I know, and and Jeff Brown turned. He, he got in his port. He, he had he had a Ferrari Testarossa. He got he got in. He, he drove that up from Birmingham to Arctic, and and there was a big meeting. And the outcome of that meeting was that we were then going to turn this really bad match day 
program <laughs> into their World Cup thing. Mm. So we we got we got hired to to make sub games for it, and I did like a goal. There was like a goal taking thing where you you would run at the ball and, and kick it, like a timing thing, like daily like daily Thompson thing. Right. You, know? you you would kick the ball and score a goal, and there was two or three things like that that me and me and Adam did, and uh, so we were part of that. <laughs> and then and then they. they they, they did this amazing what they had got good was the packaging I mean the, if you ever see it it makes a great six the, the, the game I mean, it's beautiful packaging and badges inside it and big posters and everything it was great but the game in the, in the cassette when people realised what it was because a lot of people had both you know if you're into football good chance you're going to already have the, the Arctic game mm. and up this thing would boot you know you'd, you'd sit there waiting for it and the lines would be going and the, the, the loading screen they had a new loading screen you know and then the game would come up and it was it was bloody Arctic football. <laughs> and then it just like, it, it literally kicked off, but not in a good way. You know, it was, it was, an, it was a disaster. Yeah. 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 So what was the fallout of that? Well, it's quite complicated. I mean, I mean Charles and Sons are better than me, but it, it turned out that Arctic didn't even have the rights to this game anymore. They'd sold it to someone else. They'd sold the rights wow. to someone else. And, and these guys, they, they got it and said, hang on, this looks a bit suspect. So they, they then pulled it apart and looked at the code. And, and they'd looked at the bites and said, this is our game that we've licensed underneath. Oh, my gosh. So they then, they then tried to sue US Gold. Mm-hmm. So US Gold was getting it from everybody. You know, the magazines were kicking them, the consumers were kicking them. I mean, it was scandalous. But at the same time, they were being sued by, by these other people that I, Arctic had sub, sub- leased this thing to. So it was a disaster. So Arctic, I mean, the Arctic had done this to, to save themselves because they had run out of money. Mm-hmm. And they got, they got a big chunk of it. I don't know what it was. It's probably twenty grand or something, you know, and, and that was going to keep Arctic running a bit longer. Mm-hmm. That was their that was their plan. So ultimately, ultimately, US Gold said, um, "Okay, we'll deal with these people suing us, but we're going to deal with it out of the twenty grand that we're going to pay you." So Arctic got nothing, mm-hmm. but so the, it, it didn't it didn't work out well. Yeah, and was that the end of the the software house? That was Arctic done at that point. Uh, it, it limped on a bit longer. Yeah, but it was pretty much the end. Yeah. 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 So, where does where did you leave them? When did you leave? Well, Charles, myself, and Charles. Charles's idea was to um, to, to do conversions. We, so another company was full, formed called Paragon Programming, and that was Charles's company. And, and he said, "Tony, come and work for that." So I, I went along with that. Some of the other guys did, some of them didn't, and we were we were then doing conversions for US Gold. Yeah. So what what were some of the conversions that you worked on? We did an Indiana Jones Temple of Doom arcade machine. That was really good because we had the arcade machine in the office. Um, got really good at it. There was a load of data soft things. A game called Saracen. Um, some of that stuff. I can't remember the names. Warhawk. We did a version of Warhawk. Mm-hmm. We did uh, S- Atari ST Warhawk. Okay, like so, so these were multiple platforms you were doing conversions to? Yeah, I mean, I was mostly at uh, Eva at Eva. I was either Spectrum or or Amstrad because what tended to happen was there would be a C sixty four game mm-hmm. coming from the states, mm-hmm. and then they'd say we want the we want the UK time machines. So that was we'd put them onto Spectrum and Amstrad. What was the typical deadline that you were given to do these conversions? <laughs> Two three months. Okay, yeah. so not a huge amount of time. No, and all we had was the sixty four game. Yeah, they, didn't yeah but- give, they didn't. They just said here's. They give you a cassette and they go here. Here you go. <laughs> Play this a lot and then copy it. Did you develop a system? I mean, as you're doing these things, sort of assembly line style, I mean, what was your mental process? You, you pop in the game. As you're looking at the game, thinking about how you're going to do the conversion, was there sort of a step-by-step process that you developed? Uh, it was just an easier version of writing a new game, really. I mean, it was a lot easier because you, you weren't making things up. You, know, mm-hmm. you didn't have to kind of figure it out what it was going to be, what the gameplay was going to be. I mean, it, it makes it a lot easier. I mean, typically when you're making a game, what goes wrong is your game design. You know, I mean, everyone starts off with great, great intentions. It's going to be the best game ever. And, and then you make it, and, but things go wrong, you know. You make little compromises and say, oh, this will be easier than that. And you should have gone the hard way originally. And, and you end up with not the best game in the world. I mean, that's always what happens. Uh, doing a port is easy because someone's done the hard bit, in, in a way, uh, half the job is, is what's the game going to be. So all you've got to do is copy it. Um, and you start off with the player character and the map or whatever and, and just fill it out, you know. Yeah, and were you strictly responsible for the coding or did you have to do the sprite? Uh, you know, did you have to construct the sprites and do the art and things like that too? I, have, I think I did it all. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable. 
it's just me. I think I just you just redraw it. Yeah. 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 So you move on, and I'm sure did you just get did you get tired of doing conversions at some point and want to move on? Uh, I mean, I thought it was the right. The idea was to build the company up, and and you know the dream is always making a new game, making mm-hmm. an original game, and and you know you, you think to yourself, we will do a bunch of these things, boost our money, boost our reputation, and then you know we'll do an original. It's always like we're going to do an original, and and we were we, we did it for like a year or so, and 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 in, but instead of instead of doing an original, Charles got hired. They said you're doing a great job with these ports. Why don't you come and be development manager at, at US Gold? So Charles went off to do that, and, mm-hmm. and I was like, back. I went back to Hull, and I was like, what should I do? What should I do? I was and back did, on my own. What did you do? Uh, I got together with the guys that didn't go down to London to do Paragon, who were at Arctic, uh, a guy called Adam Waring, and uh, a friend of mine from, from school called Gareth Baker, who was a CPC programmer, still is doing that stuff. And uh, we, we all just got together and hung around in Hull and, and made some games. And we did, uh, I mean, I did a game called Deathstalker, for Codemasters, and Adam did a game called Ninja Massacre for Codemasters, and that's what we did. So we, we were big friends of Codemasters for a while. Weird how they had to rename Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, but Ninja Massacre, that just flew right through. It was okay. <laughs> yeah, it was okay. Yeah, yeah but <laughs> There was no problem with that one. Yeah. <laughs> and so you're still dealing with the 8-bit machines at this point, right? It was 8-bit, yeah. 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 So what was your first foray into the ST slash Amiga scene? Uh, we, well, a similar thing happened at, at, at we call ourselves TAG, T-A-G. A similar thing happened at Adam got hired by Future Publishing to, to go be an editor of, uh, or not the editor, but something technical, a technical editor on Amstrad Action Magazine. So again, we all got split up. So I thought, what should I do? What should I do? And saw a job advert at Cascade Games in Harrogate. So, and they'd done, they'd done the Cassette 50. You remember that? <laughs> Cassette 50 was was a, a true masterpiece, but it's was it, this 50 Spectrum games on one cassette. They did a 64 one and they did a Specky one, wow. I think. And it was it was. Can't a, imagine the quality. The, Impeccable, they were, right? They were, <laughs> remember back to Input Magazine. Yeah, it was like <laughs> it was like they just typed a load of those in and put them on a cassette. But they sold bazillions of them, and the, and the, and the boss of it, he drove a Porsche 911. He, can I ask he was you, living. He was living the dream. <laughs> can I ask you a question about how that actually worked? Because I'm I'm not sure. Was it a? What, did you? Play the tape to a certain section and then load the program. How did you? How does that work? I'm not. I never had it. I never. I never tried it. But I think. I think they were. They were all on. It was be twenty five on one side of the tape, mm-hmm. twenty five on the other. And I think he, maybe they said if you fast forward the tape to like counter certain point, yeah, thirty seven. There'll be there'll be the game there, and, and maybe you'd get the right one. Maybe you wouldn't. You know, I think it's a bit <laughs> hit and miss. But they were all on a cassette. Mm-hmm. It was literally a cassette with 50 games on it. Wow. Yeah. 50 really bad games. So anyway, I'm sorry for the digression. Continue. Oh, yeah. And, and at Cascade, we, we got, we, they, they got a job for Activision to do, this, to do a game based around the hit song 19. You remember that? No, 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 19. The Vietnam War thing. Mm. So they, and they were going to do four games for Activision. Um, and as I understand it, they got quite a lot of money to do these four games, of which 19 Boot Camp was the first one. And the Porsches were all replaced with newer models. Uh, one game was produced, which was 19 Boot Camp. And I think in amongst all of that, that was 64 and Specky. And I was, I was, I was a Specky guy on that project, uh, which was a Crash Smash. Nice. I would say that, my first Crash Smash. Yeah. Um, but there was also an Amiga project. So there was an Amiga sat in the office. That was the first time I'd seen an Amiga. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What was it like moving from the 8-bit to the... Did it feel like you were free from all the shackles and chains that were bringing you down? Uh, well, the first time that I actually programmed a 16-bit machine was an Atari. I'd bought an Atari ST. And then, so when we, when we started Arctic after Cascade, you know, all the money was spent on Porsches. Um, that went down, back to Hull. Charles was bored of, of US Gold. Uh, in fact, no, he'd gone to Activision as well. Um, he was bored of that. Activision was being brought down by its U.S. owner. Mm-hmm. They were they were quite successful in, in Europe, but the U.S. office brought them down. That all went down. Um, there's a Porsche 911 story in all of that as well. Oh, tell it. Rod Cousins had a Porsche. Had a, he had a company Porsche 911. It's a, it's a recurring theme. 
and they, I think he stole it. Yeah, <laughs> when it all went down, he stole, he stole the nine eleven. I think. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And Charles stole. He had a, he had a one point nine GTI a two or five, and he stole that as well. Yeah. <laughs> so he had one of those for a while. I mean, when you say stole. He just drove it away. I think there's some shenanigans. Yeah, I think it was in. They hid it in the warehouse, or something like that. <laughs> it was in the stock warehouse, Activision stock. This this Porsche, and I think the receivers came and said, "Where's the Porsche?" And they were like, "Well, yeah, we don't know. We haven't. We ain't seen no Porsche." Kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Porsche? <laughs> what? What Porsche? Yeah, you know, I haven't seen that for a while. Yeah, and I, that went back, I think. And uh, <laughs> anyway, the Porsche was still there in the warehouse, and and and. That went, I think that's the story, something like that. Anyway, Porsche 911s. There's always a, there's always a Porsche 911 somewhere in these things. But Charles, anyway, from the, bo- from, the ba- from the back end of that came Revolution. Uh, and the first game we did was uh, obviously Lure of the Temptress, and that was Atari ST, Amiga, yeah. and, and uh, PC. And I, I, led the, I led the programming on uh, Atari ST, I think, and Amiga. So I want to talk to you about that, because um, this was a, a very ambitious first game you know the, the the way that you you created the uh what did you call the system that created the living world virtual theater yeah yeah slightly yeah. pretentiously yeah. Yeah. yeah true theater and so you had people living out their lives while you're playing so when you go to see somebody they may be there they may not be there that that sort of thing. that was the idea of it yeah. yeah yeah and so was that something that you had in mind from the beginning when you first started the initial stages of planning yeah, because what happened was Charles was Activision and his wife to be was uh, the account manager for Sierra. So they were dealing with obviously all the Sierra games from from America. They were in sub them to the to Europe basically and running that from Activision UK. So they knew they knew the sales figures on those games. They had all the numbers um, and, and direct contact with Sierra and all those things. And they said uh, these these games are doing pretty well. And Charles had done adventure games at Arctic. There's Adventure A, Adventure B, Adventure C. There's those games. They were Charles's designs. So he was like, "I want to do that. I want to do that kind of thing again." So we looked at. Uh, we all got together and we looked at Legacy Larry. And Charles was like, "Can you do anything better? Can we? What can we do to beat it?" Uh, we'd also been down to a PCW show in London, and we'd we'd been to the Level Nine stand, and they had a game called Raj. Prince of the Raj or something like that. That had characters running around. Their, their big thing was because they level nine were being squeezed as well. I mean, they did amazing adventure games, absolutely amazing company, text adventures. And their, their big idea was to have characters in the living world. And they showed it and we saw it at the show and we said, um, yeah, that's probably the way to go. So that was, you know, it's literally Larry. We, we thought there's no way those guys are going to be able to do this stuff. Um, they were good games, but they were technically, technically quite quite simple. So we thought, yeah, level nine got the right idea. So we we just went with that idea, and we we said, yeah, we can run the whole world, running people running around. Were the were the Lucas Arts games like Maniac Mansion? Were those any influence at all? No, we didn't we didn't look at them. No, later we did. We looked at uh, Monkey Island quite a lot because it, it was a big hit. So it, later when it when it was Broken Sword, beginning of Broken Sword, we were looking at um, you know we had we had. Monkey Island in the in the in the office, and we played it quite a lot. And we didn't we thought it was good, but we didn't like the humor. It was, the humor was too too silly for us. Um, so we, we we respected it, but we and we we were just trying to beat it. You know, mm-hmm. we just we just we, we were just trying to make something better rather than be overly influenced by it. You know, sure, sure. Yeah. When you're doing a an adventure game like that, um, you know what? Do you, we played a lot of adventure games on the show, and it seems like they, they, they sort of go between, you know, very simple puzzles to, you know, paste the cat hair on the driver's license to give yourself a mustache type puzzles. Yeah. And so when you're, when you're sort of forming these puzzles in your head, you know, what kind of guidelines, how do you picture yourself as the player? The hard bit is, I mean, the, the, I mean, the whole point of an adventure game is you're slowing the player down. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they just finish the game. I mean, so you, you're designing puzzles that that are going to slow people down. Mm-hmm. So you know, and if you're really desperate to do it, you make something obscure because then it takes ages to to figure it out because you you end up just trying anything. You know, uh, so that's one way of doing it. A much harder way is to make it so it feels integral to the story. You know, so it feels like it flows and it's logical, but it's still quite difficult to get. So you have to think about it, and then it, then when you get it, it actually makes sense. Rather than being, oh, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. You know, it's it's like, oh yeah, that's that's quite clever. But it's hard to design. But that was Charles's skill. 
Okay. Know? He was good at that. And, mm -hmm. you know, he'd look at them. We'd all come up with puzzles, but and then he'd go, and that's illogical, it should be this, and he'd, he'd, he'd kind of smooth them out. Was part of the design of True Theater to, to do the, what you just described, to slow the player down, because you couldn't always find the same person in the same spot? You know, to complete a, a task. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, the thing about the thing about virtual theater was it or was virtual actually, theater. Sorry. Yeah. It, it was. It was. I mean, it, it got us. It got us going because people looked in, like investor type people or or publishers or whatever. It, you know, we we had a good. We had a really good demo, and you, you would show them this thing, and with people walking around, going in and out of buildings, and dodging each dodging each other so they don't trip over, walk for each other, and things. And it, it was a good demo. Mm -hmm. and Charles would go off and do that and do this little chat thing with it, and. Uh, you know that got that got a lot of interest and it got started. I mean, as as I've said recently, I, I think it it wasn't actually very good for game design. We couldn't really do much with it. So we, you know, we did a bit in Loaded Temptress, slightly less in in Still Sky, mm -hmm. and then we dropped it completely with Broken Sword because we couldn't, we just couldn't design stuff around it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, the other funny thing was, I mean, I was looking at. I was looking at Lure the Temptress more recently and, and all the things we were really proud of that it does. And I realized we could have just faked the whole thing. It, right. Because there's no way for the player to actually track and follow yeah, the movements you don't really of every know. character. Yeah. I mean, it, it, sound, it, it sounds good. You know, people running around the world all living their lives. Sounds great, doesn't it? But like, the, they're doing it off screen. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so really, nothing is happening. Mm -hmm. and, and it would have been very easy just to fake it. You know, you know, you could look through it at the start of the game. You look for a window in a cell window, and you've trapped someone in there. And you see, you look through, and you see them running around in the cell, going bloody hell, bloody hell, you've locked me in. You know, and uh, we were really proud of that. But then, you know, it, <laughs> we could have just faked it. Why did we try and do? We did it all properly. I mean, he really was trapped mm -hmm. in the cell. But we yeah. could have just, we could have just, it could have been another cell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would have been really easy. Do you think that <laughs> at the end of the day? you think most players are happy with sort of the combination, almost the melding of genres between you have a point and click interface, but then you also have timed challenges as well, where you're expected to make certain moves within a certain amount of time. Cause I think at the beginning of the game, this is one of these things where you have the orc or whatever comes into the room, got to light the mattress on fire and then leave, but you've got to do it all within a certain time period. Yeah. You're being chased. You've got to lock yeah. the door behind you. Which I can never figure out. And it was a bit, yeah, because no one was expecting it. Yeah. And so at the time, did you think people that are in the sort of point and click adventure mode are not going to be, they're not going to be in the right mindset to complete this? Or did you just think, hey, this is a cool puzzle. Let's put it in. Uh, we just thought it was cool and people would like it. Yeah. I mean, I think in those days, it would think the genres and things weren't quite as rigid. Sure. And, and each game would, would, would look to be a progression. I mean, the, 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 in the 8 bit days, Every game was looking to be more than the last one. You know, it was always what, what's the next big thing, and and you, you go through generations of game. You go through six generations of game technology in a year. You know, so every game was a progression, and we were still in that mindset. So we we weren't worried that people would would say this isn't an adventure game. What is it? You know, it's like it's mixing genres or something. You know, we weren't worried about that. Yeah. We, ju we just said, hey, look, it's cool, right? And I, and no one came to us and said. We thought this was an adventure game, and it wasn't. It was some weird hybrid mm -hmm. shit, you know. Mm -hmm. so there was none of that, so we, we were okay. Well, yeah. I mean, what we should have done, the other thing I realized recently is if we were really going to push that technology, we should have done RPGs with it. Mm -hmm. We should have pivoted and done That's RPGs. That's the perfect games. genre to have this living world where things yeah, are yeah. happening. All the time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So talk a little bit about how the Lure of the Temptress name came about, and uh, how, because at the beginning there was no Temptress, right? There was no Temptress... Uh, the game was meant to, was supposedly finished, uh, and there was like m publishers saying, "Make a name, make a name. What's the name? Give it." And we said, "We don't only really know. It's a bit tricky." Uh, we had all things like vengeance, and all the like, vengeance was the top one. I think that we thought we were going to call it. Uh, for some reason, it sounded cool. There were a lot of one-word titles like savage. Yeah, vengeance. that kind of thing yeah. and dark. Yeah, aggressive Dark teenage thing. boy loves it. Yeah, sort of that thing. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So Virgin said, um, "Look, give us ten names." And we uh, we had like nine, and then someone said for a joke, "Lure of the Temptress," and put it on <laughs> number ten. And it was like no, it's number eleven. It was like on it was like ten, and then there was a gap, and then it was like number eleven, "Lure of the Temptress." Ha <laughs> ha That's funny, you know. And they and they Virgin of course came back and said, "Lure of the Temptress." We said there ain't no Temptress, uh, <laughs> and they said. Is is thirty grand and make the game a bit bigger because we is, we don't want to we don't want to release it yet anyway. So mm -hmm. you got three months put put the temptress stuff yeah. in. And they put a hot girl on the cover. And 
Oh yeah. Went. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think they were just interested in the cover. Actually. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, they that's put, diagnosis was built on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe they already had it. Maybe they were going, this is the cover on. Yeah. You never yeah. know with the machination. You don't know. No. So what happened after we were the Tempress? No Tempress was done for, for, you know, virtually no money at all. Uh, but it did well, got good reviews. Mm-hmm. So that then they said, let's do the next, the next stage. Oh, in the middle of it, of course, was the mirror soft thing. But, um, Robert Maxwell falling off the boat. Um, yeah, that was bad. Well, actually, you know, it turned out to be good because we'd, we'd finished the game almost, but run out of money. Robert Maxwell falls off the boat. Uh, Mirosov gets called. The receivers move into the whole mirror group and they say, we're going to, right, they're going, everything's frozen. So they froze. All of the companies owned by mirror group newspapers, newspapers were, fro- were frozen and taken into receivership because they were looking to, yeah, the pension money was gone. That was the scandal. All the pension money from mirror group was gone. So they were trying to claw back money. Um, so straight away, and this is a good story. We were talking about Bitmap Brothers yesterday. And forgive me if you've heard this story before, but um, we everyone got everyone signed to Mirosoft got a letter from the administrators, and it said, uh, "You you hereby ag- do you agree with with this statement?" And that Mirosoft have funded your game to this point. Mirosoft therefore own your game. You, you agree to this, and 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 we we the administrators are taking control of the assets of, of everything you've done, and and we'll be replacing it with another publisher at a future point. Do you agree? Yes or no? Right? We ticked the no box and faxed it back. Bitmap Brothers, we heard apparently they made another box which said "fuck off," <laughs> <laughs> ticked it and faxed it back, which was a good way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what it, what ended up coming out of that? So you you continued to own the rights to the games. Uh, there was a lot of legal toing and froing. You had to you then had to send some letter to a registered address of Mirosoft, but it was a trick because it wasn't the address of the company. It was the registered address, so you had to go to company's house and find the address. Um, we we looked into it quite carefully and got and got that right. So if you sent it to the wrong place, then you couldn't. This was breach of contract. We got them a breach of contract. You had to you had to deliver it to the right place. Mm. We did that. Um, few other people did. Some people didn't, so they didn't get out of it. Virgin Interactive, mm-hmm. Sean Brennan, who was our champion there, he went to he became marketing director at Virgin Interactive. So he said, "Hey, you know, little temptress, just bring it across, and we'll give you we'll give you the same advance that you've already spent." Yeah, because when the Again. game was actually published and released, it was under the banner of Virgin. Right? Yeah, yeah. So we sold it twice. So there was a sticky bit in the middle with, with legal things and no money and everyone everyone wondering what's going to happen. But it actually worked out very well because we sold it twice. Mm, yeah. And then we sold it another half time to put the temptress in. <laughs> <laughs> so you take all that money and success and you roll it into... Beneath for Steel Sky. Yeah. 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 Which was a very difficult game because it was it was we we said you know take it to the next level make a bigger game and that's what that's what that one was going to be yeah 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 so what was the, what was it like developing that did you feel like you achieved a level of success such that you could kind of take your time a little bit more with the development and really try and make the game that you wanted to make well yes I mean the idea was to do something really cool um, and we and we brought in the Dave Gibbons angle who was going to do the artwork and the visuals for it which was really really good um, the only thing was that there wasn't again there wasn't much money so it was quite a tight budget it was something like 60,000 quid that we developed that game I mean it's nothing nothing at all you know the people spend more than that on on the media the media spend for TikTok you know mm-hmm. on, a, on a modern game uh, it was nothing and it wasn't and it was not enough to write the game so we actually bit off more than we could chew and then the game was bigger than the amount of people we had and this kind of thing so it was on the one hand really difficult it's probably the most difficult thing i've worked on but just to get it finished we because we were so overstretched but on the other hand it was it was true sort of rock and roll we we thought we were brilliant and and and, and what and we couldn't go wrong you know so we had this kind of real real rock and roll attitude and we just we just sat in that office in Hull and, and made the game you know and we'd been there 7 days a week and it, and late into the night and you know there'd be there'd be doom on the speakers playing after 9 p.m. and stuff it was it was good it was good fun mm-hmm. it was hard but it was good fun but it was a real kind of all the people come together and just make the best game you can I mean, we were always fighting. There was a, there was a lot of aggro and, and trouble, but everyone was united. Despite all that, everyone was united to make this really great game. You know, 
Do you remember um, one of the key sort of conflicts that you had in the development between the the developers and you know uh, in terms of a gameplay element or something like that? It wasn't really the game. It was just more the personalities. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Everyone was very different. Um, yeah, it was crazy. There was the, the artists were, you know, we had a game, a, a guy called Adam Tween, who was this Geordie, cocky Geordie guy who was like. What's Geordie? Geordie, Newcastle. Newcastle. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So he'd be out, he'd be out on the town all the time um, doing those kind of things. And we were like quite studious program. You know, we were like typical nerdy programmers. We just wanted to sit in the dark and program. All these other guys, guys were out on the town and stuff. So there was really different people very different people and Dave Cummins who was a brilliant writer uh, he was very different from all of us as well so there was lots of there was lots of conflict and arguing and bitching and moaning and stuff like that but we were you know it was like a band mm -hmm. you know imagine a band you know everyone hates each other and they keep saying they're going to split up the band's going to split the band's going to split but they don't and they write a decent album you know right. that's that's what it was you know yeah. it, I, at the end of the day I mean what was the how long was the development for Beneath the Steel Side? That's a good question. Uh, it would be probably eighteen months. Okay, a couple of years. So you spent two years, and were you were you pretty satisfied with the finished product? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I think at the time we thought it was we thought it was pretty good. Um, I think it still stands up today. I don't know if anyone's played it recently. I mean, it's 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 quite a nice little. It's just the right size. It's just the right difficulty level. It's got the right. The humans are good. The writing's good. You know, Dave Cummins was was, was writing brilliant dialogue, mm -hmm. good good joke, different directions, and there's stuff in there that we just did on the weekend. You know, I mean, there was there was kind of a design, kind of kind of kind of a design. <laughs> you know, we never we never had a formal design document. So Charles would be coming in in the week, and he'd be like steering it, kind of. This is what he 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 had the vision, and, and he would he would he would kind of keep it contained. It was like you know, whack a mole. We were we were doing different bits. We were doing what we wanted in different parts of the game, and like we'd do it on the weekend. Me and Steve Odes, the the genius graphic artist who did the pixel art of the character, you know, we we'd been there on Sunday when Charles wasn't there because mm -hmm. he lived in he lived in York. We were in Hull. We'd been at the weekend and we'd do what we wanted, and we'd put Easter eggs in and all sorts of stuff, you know. And we just and then he came in on Monday and said, "What well, what have you guys been doing?" And we'd go, oh, "Nothing much, nothing much." Are there, this is, I think I asked you about this, are there any Easter eggs left that have not yet been found? Mm, probably not. Probably not. We put, we put, in those days there was the, there was the, 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 the old 8-bit idea of putting messages in the, in the binary and mm -hmm. stuff, and we did a lot of, we did, we did a lot of stuff like that, you know, a lot of programmy type things. I, I don't think there's Easter eggs that are unfound. I don't think so. Okay. Unless there's ones I don't know. That's the other thing. Yeah. I mean, later on in the broken in the broken sword days, the company was big enough that, and there'd be there'd be proper factions, and we was you know I I'd been one of the co-owners, I'd be seen as like one of the one of the bosses, so that uh, sometimes there was stuff going on that I didn't know about by that point, so that there could be stuff in broken sword that 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 was put in that <laughs> was that was like you know fuck fuck the bosses kind of stuff. <laughs> it's it's quite possible actually. Can you talk a little bit about the formation of Revolution and how that that came about? Uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that, you know, Activision was going down, Charles was looking for something to do, and he, he basically rang me up, I'd, I'd left Cascade, I'd lost, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Cas uh, Tag, Tag was after that, that had come to an end, so I was, I was knocking around looking for something good to do, Charles, Charles said, hey, come, come meet up again and let's talk, and let's look at um, these Lucas, uh, LucasArts and Sierra games and, and see what we can do. So that was his thing, his thing was Adventures. So he wanted to do. He wanted to get back into that because he'd done he'd done the Arctic A, B, and C games. Mm -hmm. So yeah, adventures was his thing. I mean, he likes the stories. Mm -hmm. and he likes all that historical stuff that he that he's into. Right, right. So beneath the steel sky is released. Was there ever a thought because it was so successful? Did you ever just think about starting beneath the steel sky two right away and kind of capitalizing on that? Uh, no, I think I think he was. He, long before Steel Sky finished, Charles was like, uh, yeah, he, he'd got into, um, I mean, he, he had this thing for Egypt. He wanted to do Egyptian stuff. So I think he went to, he went and had dinner with um, Sean Brennan, the marketing guy at Virgin. And they, and he was like, let's do Egypt, Egypt 
puzzles and things, you know, and they were like, no, 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 e- Egypt games don't, tombs and things don't sell. <laughs> Little did we know what was about to happen. <laughs> uh, you can't be raiding tombs, you know, that's no yeah, good. Yeah. Nobody uh, will buy that. Nobody it's will go for good. that. Yeah, it's a terrible idea. Uh, but they, I think Sean had just read a book called For Colts Pendulum, um, Umberto Echo, and that was like Templars. Mm. He said, Templars, do Templars. So Charles said, oh, yeah, that's quite interesting. He got researching it, and we we were like um, trying to finish Bro- beneath still sky, and he was he was researching Templars, and it just flowed into Broken Sword, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's how that came about. Yeah, yeah. Did you did you start working on that almost immediately after the release? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, you, those days you'd, you'd finish the game on a Friday, and then and then you you know Monday everyone would be back in and be like, what's the new project? Because mm-hmm. they were all on the payroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, what you needed was three months off, right? I mean, that's the difference. A, a, pop, a rock, rock group would be like, oh, we've made the album. We can go on holiday for three months. Mm-hmm. We, it wasn't like that for us. We had, we had the office to pay for. So immediately we began work on Broken Sword. And talk a little bit about Broken Sword, because that's one that I haven't played before. You've never played Broken I've Sword? I've never played Broken no. Sword. It's okay. Yeah, I, I'd like to think so. I think you're a good guy. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't do Amiga, though, unfortunately. They dropped that. So. Yeah, I yeah. guess that's why I haven't played it. Yeah, yeah. And so this was a PC-only release. What year was this? It came out in '96. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so we're in. We're well into the the CD-ROM era at this point. Yeah. And is this was this a? Did you did you take advantage of that? You know, with all that extra space, multimedia capabilities, and things like that. Well, actually, we did we did a CD32. Okay. Version of uh, Beneath the Still Sky. That was one of the ways. Actually, we ran out of money again. Yeah, we we'd run out of money on on Beneath the Still Sky. And instead of them saying put a temperature bit at the end of it or something, they said uh, they did a deal for the CD32 special version with voices. Mm-hmm. And there, so there's a big pile of money, and they said, use this money to, to finish the game, and then we'll worry about doing the voices afterwards. So it, it was one of the first games, I think, to be completely voiced and, uh, and recorded, you know, mm-hmm. and that's what we did with the CD32 um, Beneath Still Sky. Yeah. yeah. Probably didn't. Recoup your money. Uh, whoever paid, whoever yeah. paid for it, yeah. didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Broken Sword. So, this is this takes us into the nineties, and this became like a franchise, right? Or there were multiple Broken Sword games. In the end, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, how much you know as the series progressed? Did you find yourself having less and less to do with it, or were you always sort of there? Uh, yeah, well, Steel Sky. I, I kind of think of that as my game, as as you do, because um, <laughs> because the, the original design was written by myself and Dave Cummins, and we got the, the 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 process of designing the game was was like stalling and going wrong, and, and they said and Charles sent me and Dave off to Wales um, to to sit in a cottage for a week and and try and figure out a game design, and out of that week. Uh, which we we messed around, did nothing, and then the last day we panicked and wrote wrote a design which was <laughs> which was b- beneath still sky, uh, which I've still got the I can prove that I've got the design docs written on on A4 paper in in Biro, still got them, uh, and we brought that back and said here you go Charles done it, mm-hmm. and that was beneath still sky, uh, broken sword. I was I was so busy trying to finish Beneath the Still Sky that I was out, completely out of the process. So I'd like to say I'd designed Broken Sword, but I, I had very little to do with it, really. Until later on when it was just like, oh, here's a puzzle, and what do you think? And you get to go to design meetings. But the whole thing was set in place by then. You know? I, see. I see. Yeah. So what was your role, you know, going forward with Revolution after... I was by that point the company had grown so much that there was like thirty odd people in the end, so which which was a lot more than the six or seven that did um, Beneath Still Sky. So uh, I was just programming. I was one of several games games engine programmers. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I was kind of kind of at the forefront of it, but just just trying to keep ahead of the design, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened? What happened after that? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the the slow demise. I guess Revolution is still around. Still and, around, but I mean, what what yeah. sort of caused the decline? Uh, well, you, going back to Tomb Raider, um, what I mean, we were adventure games, so that was, and we were PC adventure games. That was in the mid nineties. That was not a good thing to be, because coming along was the PlayStation One. Mm-hmm. PlayStation One, I would say, it pretty much ended adventure games. It, it kind of ended the Amiga, in a way. Mm-hmm. 
because it, it switched everything switched to polygons yeah to, I mean and, and they looked the publishers were looking at Tomb Raider and they said Tomb Raider <laughs> <laughs> and Resident Evil yeah. and uh, Silent Hill, mm -hmm. and they were saying this this guy, this is the future. This is what you should be doing. Right. And we were like, oh, we want to do point and click games, you know. And they were saying, no, 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 it's old hat, it's old hat. And the magazines were a big part of it. Then they had a lot of power. If they didn't like a certain type of genre, you know, a certain type of game, they could they could turn it. You know, they could steer the industry. Oh yeah, yeah, they had huge power. So that, and you knew, you, you know, you could put any argument together to say we'll do a, we'll do a brilliant adventure game, but if they didn't, if they, if, if they thought the magazines wouldn't like it, then you, there was just no way. You know, you couldn't get the funding. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I mean, Virgin were great for a while, and then you know they spent a huge amount of money on Broken Sword because it was this big experiment to try and beat. Um, the Americans um, they wanted to beat LucasArts never works <laughs> they said they, so they threw everything and Broken Sword was the result mm -hmm. which which I think you know as Euro, you know, if you have Europe and you have Broken Sword yeah. you guys had Monkey Island and we kind of matched I mean I think they were, they were two would you agree they're kind of level equally equally good <laughs> I can't speak to that okay. I don't, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say the two best adventure games ever written were probably, but probably, it's, it's probably Monkey Island and Alcatraz. It's interesting because LucasArts did continue through the 90s. They had Full Throttle, they had Grim Pandango, yeah. you know, and so they still kind of yeah, yeah. kept the, the tradition. But I, it's possible that they they had a special arrangement with the publisher to where they could, they knew sales were not going to be PlayStation numbers, but still enough to kind of keep them afloat. Yeah, I mean, they, they were into decline as well, but they, they did keep going. I mean, yeah. they, had, they had more power and more markets. Yeah, they had Lucas's name attached to it, yeah, which yeah. probably didn't hurt. They were in a better position than, yeah. than we were. Yeah. You know, we, we were buffeted around from what's the, what's the latest thing. They, they had a much more solid bedrock to work on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they, they kept going a bit longer than us, and they mm -hmm. did some really good stuff. And, yeah, yeah, Day of the Tentacle and Full Throttle and all those things that came afterwards. Right. It was good stuff. So, you're, you continue to work in development. You still are, are part, you're still in the game. What is it like working as an independent developer? You know, what are the pluses and minuses versus working for being just one of many programmers working in a company? Well, you know, there's, been, there's been a long period of time when, when it's been very difficult. You know, and uh, uh, in, Indie wasn't really a thing, and self-publishing wasn't really a thing. There was a long time when you couldn't really, you know, all you could do is go and work, on, work for a big company mm -hmm. and be a very small cog and... Uh, you know that ends up with huge AAA projects with hundreds of people and Unreal Engine and Unity and all these kind of things. There's a lot of that stuff going on and mobile games and you know you could end up doing slot machine games for for Android and all sorts of horrible things like that. Uh, there's various ways it can go, uh, but now things have have come around again and uh, you, you you know it, you, anyone can write a game. And it can be any style. You can do a 2D point and click game like we did in the nineties. And if it's good, people will buy it. Mm -hmm. So it's all it's all come back round again. I mean the difficult thing now is there's, there's so many games. There's a sea of games out there. So, you know, what's your angle? You know, how how do you how do you reach the players? Right. That's the problem now. Uh, because you, you know I'll say we all hated the publishers, but they did it they did actually do something apparently, which was the marketing. Um and now you have to do that yourself. And some people, some people can't can't do that or don't like to do that. But yeah, you, you're going to write a game. Half your job is writing the game. The other half is marketing it. And you, you just got to do it. Yeah. We got about ten minutes left. I'd like to open the floor for questions. Everybody has a question. We got lots of questions. So we just work our way around the room. Hello. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask about the, the GBA version of Broken Sword because I found a bug in that. I think it's quite a well-known one with the GOAT and then it soft locks the game and you've kind of got to restart it. Was that anything that you guys had involved or did you just uh, farm it out to get ported? No, I did that. That was okay. actually my game. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you made you me cry. No, I didn't. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> what happens? So I think there was a bit, you've got the goat, and you've got to try and get the goat uh, a long time ago, because I'd played the PC version, I absolutely loved it, and then picked up the, the GBA version a few years later. And there's a thing, I think you have to do a certain thing in a certain order, and if you don't, it basically just soft locks the game. And I think it's, because well, when I looked it up and I thought, 
I'm an idiot. I've done something wrong. And it looked at it. I said, no, it is actually broken if you do right. things in this specific order. So, you know, I, I've never, I've never heard that before. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, not, I'm pretty but, sure it's not a fever dream, but I'll, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're probably right. Yeah. I mean, uh, that was done very quickly as well. And obviously yeah. it, was, it was, I mean, I'm quite proud of that because it was a big, you know, it was two CD games yeah, yeah. down into eight meg yeah. um, with eight bytes to spare off the end that we couldn't think of what to do with. Um, <laughs> we still <laughs> could have fixed the bug, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, there was a really big bug, which was uh, the Syria bug. I mean, there was a really big one. If you, mm. you, you could go two paths in Broken Sword, you could go to, like, Syria first or Spain. Mm. And if you went the wrong way, there's, there's like, most people go a certain way, okay? Yeah. If you went the other way, and we never did during testing. Because you're not playing it properly if you go the other way. You find the fastest way through, and that's how you test it, which isn't really testing. <laughs> um, but, you know, you get to the end, and it plays through, and you go, yeah, it works. Um, so there was the big Syria bug. Yeah. That one, I'll, I'll Google it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll, I'll try and look <laughs> well, it up. Oh, if, it's, thank if, you. if it's true, I'm very sorry. No, no, it's uh, fine. It's, it happens. Uh, but, I mean... There was nearly a broken sword two GBA, of course. That was oh, oh. that was finished to alpha, yeah. and then bam, the publisher went went bust, as these companies do. Um, and it was never it was never finished and released. But we're trying to that that stuff still exists. I mean, I, I've lost. I've got some of the sources for that. Apparently, someone else has, has managed to recover some more stuff oh, at cool. Revolution. So we might we might get another crack at that just awesome. to have, just to finish it if we can. The, 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 those guys are very busy at the moment, so it seems to have stopped again. But I'm, I'm hassling them to to try and because because it was done, you know, it was yeah, yeah. and it was it was a good thing because it was. I mean, Broken Sword was a big game. Yeah. Broken Sword Two was a slightly smaller game, so that you know there was there was a bit more space, so the graphics are slightly nicer, you know. That would be a perfect thing for a limited run games mm. to release, you know, physical packaging and everything. That yeah, be yeah, it could be good. It could be good. Yeah, I will uh, be quick because it's really not a question, but I was asked uh, by my ex-girlfriend to forward a thank you because I introduced her to Beneath a Steel Sky, uh -huh. and she still considered it, I think, the best game she's ever played. So she asked me to forward that if I got a chance. So Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, steal this time. <laughs> thank you from me. <laughs> yeah, it's always nice to hear. I mean, mostly people talk about Broken Sword, of course. So, I mean, I'm, I'm most proud of Steel Sky because it was, it was more my game, so I'm always happy to... Uh, to hear that, thank you. Anyone else? Hi, um, so Revolution got to port King's Quest Six to the Amiga. We uh, did. Yeah, we did. Yeah, doing a doing much better than the terrible jobs that Sierra been doing themselves. Um, could you yeah. tell us what led to the deal and uh, why did it only encompass King's Quest? Why not the other Sierra games? I think it was because, uh, I mean, it was such a small world. That everyone, everyone, everyone knew each other from, so a lot of the Activision people ended up back down in Virgin and things like that. So when we were busy running out of money trying to do Steel Sky, one of the things they said was, well, we, we, need, we need a port of some more Sierra games. And it, and it came through to us because they knew we had the engine. So they thought, let's, let's, let's pay them some money to do the King's Quest thing and that can help them get through this other project. So I think it was, it, I mean, it's a nice idea. Uh, it would have been better if they'd just given us some more money, to be honest. Because obviously once you have to do a port of King's Quest, then, then you have to do the port of King's Quest. <laughs> and, and, and when you're doing that, you're not doing Steel Sky. So it, it was kind of it was kind of good to be asked, but it was it was a pain because we had to. What we got out of it was we wrote some tools to to organize the graphics and stuff, and that that was useful to us. Um, but yeah, they just it just came through the business channels and said, "Can you can you do it for us?" Because they couldn't do it. I mean, basically, they 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 their office over there couldn't couldn't handle it. So they said, "Can you do it?" They, they said, "Get some tweaky little European people to do it because they're good at compressing things and." and doing doing got that job yeah i think it was all right wasn't it yeah it was a good thing sierra didn't do it yeah considering what they've done before yeah i mean they, they should have either given us all of them to do or, or yeah 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 that's the story behind that thanks <laughs> all right uh, oh we got one back here hi tony uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask specifically on the, the Amiga side, what uh, development sort of uh, platform you would use for developing on it for Lure and uh, Beneath the Steel Sky and what languages? 
you we were used uh, the really nice PDS system, which which was mentioned yesterday. P yeah, you were talking about PDS, yeah, weren't you, yeah. Stu? PDS was the best thing ever, and we used it for Spectrum and um, and, and ST, and I think Amiga as well. And uh, I mean, there was a lot of I've, I've told this story before, but you know, when I went to work at Cascade, that was the first time I'd seen PDS systems, and they had a whole room. Everyone was using PDS. And it and it turned out the the boards they were using for because it, it was a board that, that that we had to we had those Amstrad PCs you know Amstrad sixteen forties there was a room full of those and they were all running PDS and um, the boards the boards for the PDS systems they all had the the name of some Harrogate electronics company on them <laughs> so they were they were they were basically manufacturing their own PDS boards so they were they were all bent boards um, when I left Cascade I, I, I it, the whole company, for, for various reasons, it all broke apart before this nineteen game was finished. So I said, "Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to leave because uh, everyone's bored of working here, and the management's awful." And they said, "But you got to finish the game." And I said, "Give me the PDS system, and I'll finish the game." So I got a PDS system, and that's that was used um, to do to do all the tag games. And then I think probably Charles, we maybe we persuaded him to to buy a, an Atari ST a PDS system. I mean, it was just really good because you you just you just press build and it would go and the the game would pop up. It was I mean for the spectrum it was just amazing. There was nothing like it. I mean the opposite end. I mean this is say you know this is the this is the eighties. You got the best you got the best development system ever. Press build one second. You know one one to two seconds later your your spectrum game is running and and you could it was so good because you could just I mean the way I work is it's just iteration. You you see something and you go no it must be pixel to the right. Pixel build, build, but and you might run the game like twenty times in a minute just to tweak something, you know. And it's a great way to work, just iterating like that. Yeah, and the op in the world now is like Unity. And you go right, Unity, run the game, and it's like okay, and it's like assembling. What does it say? It says assembling, assembling archives or something like that. Assembling subsystems, and it's like yeah, okay, let's just wait while Unity does its thing and it's the opposite because you can't get into this flow state of just testing 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 it's a real pain um i mean i'm back on the i'm doing spectrum next stuff now and it's 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 almost fast again you know because you can press i mean i'm using the c spec so you, so you can do it all on a pc and you, you press build and up it comes you know it's it's almost back to as good as it was in the 80s um but yeah that's how we did amiga we did we, we used pcs and, and it just squirted down it was good. Did you ever get your 911? No. <laughs> it's not too late, though. Yeah. So speaking of not too late, um, you are still active developing, and you have a blog, right, where you sort of talk about what you're up to? I have a blog on itch.io or, or Substack. I'm trying to move it over to Substack. But yeah, I do, I do, I do a blog. So if people want to follow your various yeah, adventures, yeah. what's the best way to, uh, to find them? Uh, sub probably join the Substack, UFO Spares, Tony Warren. And uh, I mean, uh, for those that don't know, I'm working with Stu, the amazing Stu. So we've we've sort of teamed up. We're doing a, we're doing a game called Urbex Warriors for the next, and so we'll do the next one. Then we'll do the Amiga one. Then we'll, maybe we'll do the Dreamcast and Steam. So that so uh, we're back. You know, we're back on the eight bit. We're back on the sixteen bit, and life is good again. And uh, yeah, yeah. But it's not too late to buy a nine eleven. I mean, they they cost about double what they used to do, but <laughs> they do still make them. You know. And the petrol ones are going to live on. We've got another 10 years of, like, of petrol cars, so <laughs> it's not too late. <laughs> we've got time sharing. <laughs> yeah, we, we can share one. Stu. Yeah, we'll share. All right, let's give a big hand to Tony Warner. <laughs> so that's going to do it for this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed that talk with Tony. He's a really great guy. Um, I got a chance to spend a lot of time off mic with Tony since uh, we were roommates along with Stu Cambridge in Nottingham for Kickstart. Uh, I want to extend another special thank you to Ravi Abbott for having me and Tony and Stu all over for his outstanding event. And uh, we will be back next week with Lure of the Temptress, not Lure of the Temptress, that's Tony's game. <laughs> we'll be back next week with Prophecy One, the Viking Child. So um, again, uh, Aaron should be recovered and we should be back to business next week. Until then, guys, we'll see you next time, and adios. Are you a sketchy tech? Do you have the right tools for the job? 
Have there been incidents? Next time, don't try to fix it yourself. Send your broken Amiga to Retro Rewind. Get a full diagnostic, a reasonable estimate, and the peace of mind knowing that your machine is in the hands of real technicians with decades of experience and cutting-edge repair equipment. Save 10% off your repair with the promo code AMIGOS10. Thank you to RetroRewind.ca for supporting this episode. Amigos is made possible by contributions from listeners like you. Patreon supporters help choose the games we play, receive exclusive magnets, and get access to the Amigos Retro Gaming Discord server. Visit patreon.com slash amigospodcast if you'd like to support the show and join our community.